Hi amazing viewers, welcome to Christianity Over Islam channel with Sam Shimon and on today's episode of this amazing debate, Sam Shimon is on a live debate, a live discussion with a Muslim who considered leaving Islam. Let's watch this video as we find out more truth. Be glorified. So I'm here buddy, any questions you got man? Oh, all sorts of questions, because uh, I've been doing a lot of research. Sure, uh, sure. Let me just grab me. I've got quite a few things written down here. Um, I think one of the main things that I want to speak about, and this has been a big struggle of mine, is because yes. when I came into Islam, uh, as I explained before, I immediately noticed that the Hadith was very questionable. The, the, the way that Muhammad is painted out in the Hadith is very questionable. And so I immediately went to the Quran only perspective. Yes. And I think because I've spent so much time convincing myself of this Quran only perspective, I think that is what is holding me back. Now, if uh, you could show me um, your reasons why you believe that the Quran only perspective is completely um, un reliable cannot be the viewpoint uh, from the from the perspective of the Quran oh, then yes. then I then uh, obviously I have no other option but to leave Islam because I cannot follow an yes. Islam that needs the hadith that needs the version of the Muhammad that they um, put forward precisely now I just sent you a link in private chat and for the rest of you I put it in pub, uh, in the com comment section when you get a chance, all of you, and especially you, Milo, when we're done, I did a series of articles for the Quran only Muslims to answer, just from the Quran. It's there. It's called The Incoherence of the Quran, Unintelligibility. Just from the Quran, why the Quran <clears throat> cannot be used as the sole source <clears throat> for a Muslim. So if you're just the Quran only, you're going to be in trouble. So I can walk you through this. Just basically, but then later on, spend time reading through the articles. Number one, you're aware that the Quran does say that it is a book that explains all things in detail, right? Yes. So you're aware of that I don't need to go through those verses like chapter 6, verse 114, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> chapter 10, verse 37, chapter 12, verse 111, right? Yeah, chapter I think one, verse three. So you got that. I We've established that. This is one of the biggest problems is just how much I've looked into the Quran only arguments as part of the thing that's stopping me so much. So, but you, you are that. May the Lord Jesus Christ anoint me to recall all these facts and verses perfectly accurate without error. But you're aware of that, so I don't need to prove that, right? Yes, of course. But if you want to go through anyway, because uh, 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 God willing, I'll show uh, other Muslim friends of mine this video because it might help them also. Okay. Well, let's go. Uh, let me give you another uh, passage that I uh, another article related to this and we'll go through that article because I've done extensive like I said discussion on the Quran claiming that explains all things in detail meaning that the Quran is supposed to give you a complete exposition fully detailed explanation of its passages so everything in the book is supposed to be explained in detail that's what the Quran claims but then it contradicts itself but let me just get you another article and then we're going to go through some examples this is one I wrote in response to a Sunni Muslim named Basam Zawadi so let me just get it there so yeah it's it's a it's a problem Quran only position doesn't work but here it is another article we'll just quote from this article here guys so you save the material use the material as well so here it is in the screen, but here's that for you, right? Okay, now let's go through it. You ready? I'm going to put it on the screen. I gave you the articles, but I'm going to put it on the screen. You ready? I can't yeah. hear you. Yeah, yeah, let's go, let's go. All right, here you go. So the Quran claims it explains its passages in detail. Here it is. Let's begin. One at a time. Okay. And I even show when these surahs supposedly are compiled, which depends on information outside the Quran. Because remember, I'm writing to a Sunni Muslim. But forget whether it's Meccan or Medina, because you won't, you won't know that from the Quran. And thus do we explain the ayat in detail, chapter 6, verse 55. Ayat 
in detail. All right, let's go through it slowly. And then I'm going to show you that's impossible. It doesn't. All right, here we go. So, guys, follow with us and pray for us. Here we go. Here's this right here. Another one. This is chapter 6, verse 97, 98. It is he who has sent set the stars for you so that you may guide your course with their help through the darkness of the land and the sea. We have indeed explained in detail. We've explained in detail our ayat. That was, that's the word for verses. Okay. And then we continue later near the end of the verse for time. Indeed, we have explained in detail our revelations. Okay. So a few more. Watch here. 6114. 6105. I'm going to post it here. That article has a lot of verses. So the Quran goes out its way to say it, but then it contradicts itself. Thus we explain variously the verses so that they, the disbelievers, may say, you have studied the books of the people of the scripture, and that in parentheses, that's their insertion. So that we may make the matter clear for the people who have knowledge, right? Make it clear. So these verses are supposed to make it clear and not confuse you. That's 6105. But now notice 6114. Say, O Muhammad, shall I seek a judge other than Allah, while it is he who has sent down unto you the book, explained in detail? That's 6114. Explained in detail? All right. A few more. I want to get you the most salient ones. Chapter 7, verse 32. Chapter 7, verse 52. All right. <clears throat> and 7, 174. And a few more for good measure, and then we go into it. So here you go. Okay, right here. Oh, we're gonna go through. Sorry, it says then go through. Let's see. Yeah, it's not letting me. Oh, well, let me let me break it down. Hold on. Sometimes uh, this gives me a hard time. One second, because I want to put it there. All right, let's do this. Let's see if this is gonna go through. All right, here it goes. It says, "All right, <clears throat> say, O Muhammad, who has forbidden the adoration with the clothes given by Allah, which has produced for slaves and a tayyibat? Say." Right? The life of the world, blah, blah, blah. Let's go to the end of the passage. Thus we explain the ayat in detail, in detail for people who have knowledge. Now, that was 732. 752. Certainly we have brought to them a book which we have explained in detail with knowledge. So this book is explained in detail with knowledge. 7174. And I'm going to wrap it up with three more verses. Okay? 7174. Thus do we explain the ayat in detail. All right. See, it's repeated over and over and over again. But for the sake of time, I'm going to give you three more. And there's a lot more. Chapter 10, verse 37. Chapter 10, verse 37. Watch this one. This one is pretty straightforward. And this Quran is not such as could ever be produced by other than Allah. But it is a confirmation, which was before it, the Torah, the, the Injil, and a full explanation of the book. Full explanation, 1037. All right, well, that's not clear. Chapter 12, 111. Chapter 12, 111. So here you go. Chapter 12, verse 111. It is not a fourth statement, but a confirmation of Allah's existing books and a detailed explanation of everything. Detailed explanation of everything. That's chapter 12, verse 111. That means everything... In the book is detailed fully, completely. Things in the book. That's what it says. 1689. 1689. One day we shall raise from all peoples a witness against them from amongst themselves, and we shall bring thee as a witness against these. And we have sent down to thee the book explaining all things. A guide, a mercy, and glad tidings to the Muslims. And here I'm going to give you two versions of this verse. Chapter 41, verse 3. And this is one of the favorite verses of Quran-only Muslims, like Rashad Khalifa. 41, verse 3. A book whereof the verses are explained in detail. So the verses are explained in detail. A Quran in Arabic for people who know. Now here's Rashad Khalifa's translation. These are the verses that Rashad Khalifa and Quran Yun, Quran-only Muslims, use. I learned it from them. Here's his translation. A scripture whose verses provide the complete details in an Arabic Quran for people who know. So we've established that, right? You got that, Milo, so far? Yeah, indeed, I'm following. Okay, but we got a problem. The most basic problem you have is, how do you even know what the Quran is? 
How do you know how many chapters compose the Quran? How do you know how many verses make up each chapter? And how do you know when the Quran was compiled? From the Quran alone. That's just the basic problem you have. Just beginning with the Quran itself. How do you justify the Quran? In other words, for this to make sense, you have to already know what the Quran is, how many chapters <clears throat> does it consist of, and how many verses make up each chapter. So right there, the Quran implodes because you cannot even justify the Quran from the Quran. Tell me what the Quran is, how many chapters, and when. Now, from the Quran alone, answer those questions. Yeah, well, this is one of the issues because uh, I remember when I first came into Islam, I asked um, if you were to put a person on an island who had never seen or known of Islam before and just give them the Quran by itself, what would they come up with? Yeah. And the more and more you think about it, you just think, well, just very confused, I think, is what they'd end up being That's because there's not much to, to understand by just using the book alone without exactly. the traditions, the culture, the hadith, everything that comes from it. But then my question is, because I don't know much about the Bible, am I going to get the same problem with the Bible? No. Does because that the Bible does, no, because the Bible doesn't make the same claim for itself that the Quran does. Yeah. Okay. See, you're comparing apples and pineapples. The Bible does not make this claim for itself. In fact, the Bible presupposes that there's going to be a community that have been entrusted with these texts to expound them. So we don't make the same claim. The Bible does not make the same claim. Mm -hmm. In fact, apart from the Bible being inspired, it is a collection of books written by different people over a 1500-year period. So when we compare the Bible and the Quran, it's an unfair comparison. The Quran supposedly comes through one man. So if you want to compare the scriptures of the Christians with the Quran, you have to compare a book of the Bible with the Quran, not the books with one book. You understand my point? Mm -hmm. In other words, you take Luke and compare it with the Quran. Author by author or book by book, not a collection of books in comparison to one book that supposedly came through one man. And even that information depends on sources that come over 100 years after the reported death of that man. Even his death is based on these later sources. Because you can't tell me Muhammad was born in 570 AD. How do you know that? Well, you have to appeal to these sources. How do you know when Muhammad died and where? Well, you have to appear to these sources. Well, that's the problem, right? Whereas in the collection of the books we call the New Testament, this is not my opinion. Even a Bart Ehrman, who's a skeptic, as an historian, he will tell you that the only documents we have from the first century are the books of the New Testament. And he will tell you, Paul's letters can be situated historically because he gives you enough statements internally to situate the historical context and Luke in Acts mentions certain rulers that extra biblical archaeological discoveries have confirmed so we have books that mention events rulers places individuals that can corroborate its historical setting so you're comparing apples and pineapples yeah no that makes sense and the Bible uh, it was written and compiled a lot closer to the death of and resurrection, I guess, of Jesus yes, yes, of than course, yes. the Hadith and whatnot is to... No. That's why I'm not, I appeal to Ehrman because Muslims love him. Ehrman is an atheist agnostic. He thinks the Bible is full of errors. It has variant readings. But he does tell you that as an historian, we look to the writings of Paul and the Gospels and apply historical method to at least ascertain the things that the historical Jesus did and his followers. And so... That tells you that the books we have give us enough information to place itself within a certain historical period. The Quran doesn't have any of that. Why do you think now you have revisionist scholars that say, well, the Quran seems to be actually situated in Petra, right? You've heard those theories. Yes. Dan Gibson and Jay Smith champions those views because the Quran has no context. It does not tell you. In fact, some of the references to its geography do not sit well or fit well with Mecca or Medina. So here it is. The first problem you have as a Quran only Muslim, situate the Quran for me. Tell me when, where, and how. Just from the Quran. You can't do that, right? No, you can't. And I, and I, I do 
also a question, can it be done outside of Islamic sources? Like, is there anything outside of Hadith and, and Muslim writings that actually positions Muhammad or the Quran or anything like that? Yeah, well, we, we have Christian writings that some date to, let's say, between 630 and 640 AD, where we have a Christian author mentioning the Muslims, but he doesn't call them Muslims. And he presupposes that Muhammad is still alive at that time. But even this writing, right, is based on a later source. But the person who wrote it, we know that the historical context in which he wrote would have been between 630, 640 AD. And I believe, again, I don't want to misquote his name, is Sibius. But if you go with his chronology, Muhammad is still alive in the 630s. And he's leading the expedition. But even what he wrote is based on later copies. You see my point? Yeah. Right? Now, let me let me show you some more problems. If you want me to go through the problem of the Quran, try to answer just from yeah, Sebius, S A B E O S. It may there be O U S. May the Lord help me recall this. But he's writing around the six uh, six hundred thirties, six hundred thirty four, and his comment assumes Muhammad is still alive. Well, according to the sources, Muhammad is dead. 632 so if you go with these sources you can get an an idea that there was a man named muhammad but you don't get really the later view that muhammad was a prophet and a messenger more like he was a leader and that his followers are actually devotees of moses that's what you get from these outside sources right but with that said just to give you some exact problems with the Quran only position and try to answer this. This is chapter 111 of the Quran. Now remember, the Quran says it's fully detailed. It's going to explain everything in the book, right? Mm -hmm. You can't, the, some of the Quran only Muslims tap dance around this. No, no, it says it explains the verses in detail and a full exposition of everything in the book. All right. The power of Abu Lahab will perish and he will perish. Who's Abu Lahab? I'm not too sure. Exactly. So why is he so important that there's an entire chapter mentioned cursing him and his wife to hell? What the hell did he do, pun intended, to get Allah so upset that he devotes an entire chapter to this man? Abu Lahab means father of the flames. That's a derogatory term. We don't even know his name because Abu Lahab means father of the flames. That's not his name. That's the author of the Quran making fun of him, that you are the father of flames, the owner of the flames because you're going to hell. His wealth and gains will not exempt him. He will be plunged in flaming fire, and his wife, the wood carrier, will have upon her neck a halter of palm fiber. What the hell is this about? Yeah, this is very strange. Is this where is this in the chapter one hundred eleven of your Quran? So at the yeah. it's right there in your Quran near the end, chapter one hundred eleven. Mm -hmm. So if Allah authored this, why is Allah? so upset with this individual and his wife that he devotes an entire surah to curse him, damn him to hell, and mock him by calling him the owner of the flames. That's what Abu Lahab means. Who is he? Yeah, not a color. See? Let me give you some more. All right? I can go on like this all day, right? So who do you, who and when do you think this was constructed then? Who did it and when did it happen? Because if it didn't happen at the time of Muhammad, maybe afterwards they used his name and his and his yeah. uh, journey and everything and just bolted onto it, this religion. Well, I, I, I am not a revisionist in that. I don't hold the view that Muhammad did not exist because I don't completely you know trash the later traditions i believe these later traditions though exaggerated and there's a lot of lies in it do have kernels of truth so i don't have a problem with a muhammad existing and making claims but the problem is the evidence is not strong so i will presuppose the islamic narrative what the sunnis say right so i don't go the route of complete skepticism that muhammad if he existed was a general but the muhammad of later tradition who claimed to be a prophet messenger that Muhammad did not exist. I'm okay with saying there was a Muhammad that claimed to be a prophet and messenger. But the problem is... Alright guys, this is where this video gets more interesting. If you are yet to subscribe to this channel, please do so. Hit the notification button to be notified each time we post new video.
Let's get back to this video to find out more truth. The Muslims who then go to these later sources cannot simply choose and pick what they like and ignore the, the statements in the same corpus that show Muhammad was a pedophile, a murderer, evil, wicked. You can't do that. Yeah. See, this is the dilemma for the Muslim, not for me. I can, I don't care about Muhammad. I don't care about Islamic tradition. But since I'm dealing with Muslims, I'm going to use their sources against them. But when they start questioning their sources, I go, now you buried the Quran. Now you have no justification for the Quran. You cannot justify the Quran. You cannot tell me the historical context Quran. Because you can't just take those hadiths that agree with your assumption of what Muhammad was and what he can be like, because that's circular. No, we know Muhammad is a prophet of mercy. Well, how do you know that? Well, because the Quran tells you. Well, how do you know the Quran is talking about that Muhammad? Because the name Muhammad only appears four times. So every time it mentions the prophet, how do you know it's in Muhammad? Well, we go to the hadith. Yeah, but these hadiths incriminate him. It shows he's a murderer, a pedophile, a uh, whoremonger, right? <clears throat> Wicked, immoral. Oh, no, those statements were lies. So your Muslim community decided to make up statements to make their prophet look like a devil. But you assume he wasn't the way these hadiths depict him because you've been duped into thinking he must be merciful. And then you reject these statements, but these are the same hadiths, same corpus you're dependent on to even tell me that Muhammad was a prophet and he was born this time and he did these things. That's circular. You can't get away with it. Mm -hmm. Right? Let me give you another example, and I want to see if you can explain this one. This is chapter 33, verse 37, right? Of the Quran. Yeah. Okay. And then if you have other questions, let me know, because I can give you example after example like this. And when thou saidst unto him on whom Allah hath conferred favor, and thou hast conferred favor, keep thy wife to thyself and fear Allah, and thou didst hide in thy mind that which Allah was to bring to light, and thou didst fear mankind, whereas Allah hath a better right that thou shouldst fear him. So when Zayd had performed the necessary formality of divorce from her, we gave her unto thee in marriage, so that henceforth there may be no sin for believers in respect of wives of their adopted sons when the latter have performed the necessary formality of release from them. The command of Allah must be fulfilled. Who the hell is Zayd? No, not a clue. <laughs> and who is this man that Allah is saying, you hid in your heart because you were afraid of what people would say, but you should have feared Allah more. Who is he? It does not tell you. But see, if you don't go to Hadith, you're stuck. But now if we go to Hadith, it's embarrassing. Even this passage in of itself is embarrassing. Why? Mm -hmm. Because it's talking about this man who was afraid to let it out that the wife of Zayd was predestined or chosen by Allah to marry him so that Zayd would divorce her so he could have her. So set an example of people who have adopted sons that when their adopted sons divorce their wives, then the adoptive fathers can marry their daughter-in-laws that have been divorced by their adopted sons. Now, let me ask you something as a moral person created in the image of Christ, whose image you still bear because it hasn't been effaced, are you okay, because this is the Quran now, forget about who it is, we'll talk about that later. Are you okay with Allah saying that, hey, if you have an adopted son and he divorces her, it's okay, you can go marry her and make her your wife, was previously your daughter-in-law, and now you make her your adopted son's mother. Are you okay with that? Well, no, you wouldn't do it. But your God says that's exactly why this man was supposed to take his adopted son's divorced wife when he was done divorcing her so he can marry her to set a precedence for others. Mm -hmm. What kind of example is this? Yeah, not a very good one. I mean, the, these are the sorts of things that, that I need to hear, to be honest, because the problem is, is that a lot of the videos that I listen to, they just um, go on about Hadith, and I, I already reject Hadith. It's not the Hadith that I need to be convinced against it's things like this that i need to hear that's actually in the quran that's right just acceptable uh so that, that's why i'm here. asking you just the quran this is in fact i'll give you one in plain english because mm -hmm. this is like elizabethan english a little hard to understand so let's go with now they apply they had a lot of commentary 
because they have to do a lot of explaining in parentheses and bracket. Here's plain English. This is Al-Ali Khan. They're Salafi, so they add within brackets, parentheses, explanatory material that they get from the Hadith. Okay, watch here. Here you go. Let's let's see where it starts. Sometimes, okay. And remember, when you said to him, see now it provides explanation, Zayd bin Haditha, the freed slave of the Prophet. See, they have to add. They have to make sense of the Quran. On whom Allah had bestowed grace by guiding him to Islam. And you, O Muhammad, have done favor by manumitting him. According to tradition, he had set him free and adopted him as a son. You're not going to get that from this verse. But just the plain English, you can see what it's saying. Mm -hmm. And he said to him, keep your wife to yourself and fear Allah. So he's saying, hey, hey, Zayd, keep her. Don't divorce her. Why? But you did hide in yourself. You were hiding in your heart. What Allah had already made known to you, that he will give her to you in marriage. Now that's in parentheses. But still, that's what the tradition says. So understand the implication. This man lusted for his daughter-in-law. When Zayd finds out and he wants to divorce her, the man says, keep her, don't divorce her because he don't want to be humiliated. And then Allah rebukes him. You are hiding in yourself that which Allah will make manifest, which Allah was about to make public because you did fear the people. Now they add in parentheses, Muhammad's married the divorced wife as a man made a slave. Forget that part. But you did fear the people, whereas Allah had a better right that you should fear him. Why do you care what people think? Allah made her your wife after he divorced her. So when Zayed accomplished, Zayed accomplished, watch here, his desire from her, I divorced her. We gave her to you in marriage so that in future there may be no difficulty to the believers in respect of the marriage of the wives of their adopted sons. When the latter have no desire to keep them, I they've divorced them. And all this command must be fulfilled. What a wicked, filthy command. You, whoever you are, you're going to marry your adopted son's divorced wife, who at one time was your daughter-in-law. Even though you try to discourage him to divorce her because you were embarrassed of the repercussions, what people would say, in order that you marry her and set a precedent so other people can do the same if their adopted sons divorce their wives. Now, yes. the verse itself, if you have any dignity, you should throw up and spit on this book. How the hell are you going to marry your daughter-in-law who is sleeping with your adopted son, and now you're going to sleep with her, and now your adopted son has to look to her, a woman that he had sex with as his mother now? Yeah, that's crazy. But it's in your Quran. Uh, yeah. No hadith. Forget the hadith. Just the verse itself. Mm -hmm. So... Now, without the Hadith, you can't tell me what this is about, right? No, you just won't know. But if I go to the Hadith, it's going to be embarrassing. Mm -hmm. If I now quote the Hadith, I have an article on this. The older tradition says, you know what it says? And I'll get you the article, but I'm going to sum it up for you. You know what the older tradition says? Here we go. That Muhammad went to visit Zayd. Now, let me give you a story of Zayd. Zayd ibn Haritha. Let me tell you how wicked Muhammad was. I'm going by the traditions. But just the Quran itself, you should spit on it for what you just read. If you have any moral d dignity. And I know you do. That's why you're troubled. Because the Spirit is bringing you home. But the traditions say that five years before Muhammad supposedly became a prophet. His wife Khadija bin Khuwaylid had a slave who had been taken captive. He was kidnapped. Zayd bin Haritha. When Muhammad married her, Zayd became his slave. Now his father, Zayd's father, and his father's brother had heard. That he was in Mecca. So they went to emancipate him. This is in the Muslim tradition. Right? Just to give you what the Muslims say about this passage. Okay. So when they came looking for him, they told Muhammad, we want to free our son. How much do you ask? He goes, it's not up to me. If he wants to go back, he's yours, free of charge. I'm not going to charge. So Zayed came and he said, no, I don't want to be free. I'd rather stay Muhammad's servant than go back with you. When Muhammad saw that, the traditions say he was so moved. That he took Zayd in front of the Kaaba and he announced to everyone. He announced to everyone. I, of this day, as of today, set Zayd free and I adopt him as my son. I now declare Zayd not my slave, but my son. That was five years before he supposedly became <clears throat> a prophet. So that was in 605 AD. Because he supposedly became a prophet in 610. From 605 AD all the way until he went to Medina... So he migrated to Medina, according to Muslim sources, 622 AD. So notice, 605, 
622. That's and then this verse comes several years after that. So over 15 years, right? This man was called Zayd, son of Muhammad. So now it says Muhammad had ordered Zainab, his cousin, Muhammad's cousin. He ordered her to marry Zayd. She didn't want to marry him. She was not attracted. He goes, you have to. And yet, according now, this is Muslim sources. Now, I know I don't follow. I'm just giving you what the Hadith say. The verse before this one, chapter 33, verse 36, was supposedly sent down to rebuke Zainab and her brother for refusing to marry Zayd. So this verse was sent down. Now, I'm going with the Hadith now. Just follow me because I want to show you what the Sunnis say. 33, 36. This is the verse before 37. It is not for a believer, man or woman, when Allah and his messenger have decreed a matter that they should have any option in the, their decision. See, this is Muhammad now saying, hey, hold on. Allah and I have said, you, Zainab, are going to marry Zayd. You have no option. Once we've decreed it, you got to believe. And whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger, he has indeed straight and plain error. Now, even without the hadith, are you not troubled that this messenger, whoever he is, has put himself on the level of your God because his decree is God's decree. It doesn't say what Allah has decreed. When Allah and his messenger have decreed, making the messenger's partner in the decree. And you don't see any deification in this? Yeah, well, this is a thing. It's, it struck me at the start. And then when I started, and I'd like to know your opinion on this, when I looked into the Quran only view on this, they, they have this idea of, oh, what? Muhammad is saying here is that if you follow just to follow the messenger is just to follow the message and by and it's it's essentially the same following Allah. That's okay, and, even if they say that. I'm, I don't have a problem with the message. The problem is why say when Allah and His messenger have decreed? Why not just simply what Allah has decreed? Yeah, well, this is what the Quran only people say is that the the messenger only decrees the message. And so, therefore, it's Fine. not an issue. But why attribute it to him as if it's his message? Allah and his messenger decree. That's what I'm talking I'm not talking yeah. about the mm -hmm. message. Okay, we're going with that. Mm -hmm. But why then say Allah's decree is Muhammad's decree when it's not Muhammad's decree? He's only relaying the message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's my problem with the, uh, with the stance as well. Exactly. That's not an answer to the problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's relaying message. So it's not his message, right? It's Allah's message. So why why not say when Allah has decreed a matter? Why say when Allah and his messenger have decreed a matter? Making the decree also part of what Muhammad decrees with his God. If he's only a messenger that relays it, it's like uh, you have your mailman. He delivers a message to you, right? He delivers it, right? Mm -hmm. All he's doing is sending you a letter. But that letter comes from the person. So you won't say, this letter is the letter of the man and the mailman. Yeah. Did you yeah, say that? Uh -huh. Doesn't make sense, right? No. Okay, now, just to show you how bad it is, chapter 4, verse 80. He who obeys the messenger has indeed obeyed Allah. So Muhammad, if we go to later tradition, has made obedience to him the same as obeying Allah. Okay. But now what's the point? And 3336, if I were to ask you, without appealing to the hadith, what the hell is this passage about? What did Allah and his messenger decree that if you don't follow, then that shows disobedience to Allah and his messenger? So let me give you an example of the mailman again. Mailman comes and gives me a letter from the court that you have to appear to court before the judge. If you don't before appear before the judge, you will be punished. Would it make sense to say, because you disobeyed the order of the judge and the mailman, you are indeed astray? No, well, no, then they open it up to lots of issues, like the mailman then making all his own rules, which is what's happened here. Because it says, if you disobey all in his messenger, mm -hmm. you have deemed gone astray, right? Uh-huh. But wait, Muhammad is just the mailman, right? He's just, according to the Quran, he's just delivering the message, right? Mm -hmm. So I say, if you've disobeyed Allah and his messengers, like saying, man, I disobeyed the the justice and the mailman. 
that makes no sense all right welcome back guys i believe you were able to learn something let us know what you were able to learn on account of watching this video in the comment section let us interact and also don't forget to like our video subscribe to this channel and hit the notification button to be notified each time we post new and amazing videos like this and also don't forget to share our videos with your friends and your family and from the highlights for this video the quran claimed it explains everything in details but a careful study of the quran reveals the truth that it is not true because there are a lot of details in the quran that we are left out you have to go outside of the Quran to get the little little details and so, not so many so many details that we are left out which is contrary to what the Quran said. If you are saying that a book explains everything in details, it means everything, every story, every detail should be captured. But that is contrary to the view the Quran holds if you do a careful study of the Quran. and. Um, one of it was the name of the children of Adam. You have to go outside of the Quran to, for you to be able to know their names because the Quran did not give a detailed explanation of their names and the person who killed the other. You have to either go to the Bible or to the Hadith. And this is another proof now. This is also a proof that Muhammad stole a lot of things in a hurry from the Bible just to credit his Quran to make it make sense to his readers and at that point he did not capture their names and also the person that killed who which we all know that it is king that killed abel and those are their names so if the quran did not capture this these names and the bible does not make such claim that it explains everything in details in case you are you are doubting that oh the bible will also make such claim the bible never made any claim that it explains everything in details in fact the bible says that if it is to capture everything the whole book the books in the, in the whole world will not be able to contain it so the bible never made such claim that it explains everything in details and there are a whole lot of differences between the bible and the quran and i believe there are also similarities and the similarities is where we made the assumption or we made the claim that Muhammad stole a lot of things from the Bible. And so there are a whole lot of contradictions in the Quran and also a lot of incomplete statements in the Quran also, which to me is so much for a book that says it explains everything in details. And also the prophet marrying his adopted son's wife, which is so embarrassing because he believed his adopted son's wife was destined for him to get married to. So he had this adopted son had to divorce his wife so that the prophet can marry his wife, which to me is embarrassing. And when people started questioning his character and why would he, why would the prophet do such a thing? He now went back and told them that Allah has instructed him to abolish adoption which means at that point his adopted son is no longer his son so he has the legal rights and has the moral rights to marry the woman you can see how a prophet can bend the laws of a god of a god he claimed he's serving just to suit his own belief system guys let's know what you were able to learn watching this video and we also believe that this video was able to educate you about the belief in islam let us know in the comment section and if you are yet to subscribe to the channel please do so hit the notification button to be notified each time we post new and amazing videos like this thank you for watching see you in our next video